Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to continue drawing out the line of Papal Rome. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the opportunity once again to open your word. And we invite your spirit here into our midst. We know we have still so much to learn. And we are thankful for the way that you have led in, in our understanding of, of Daniel chapter 11 and also the revelation of Christ to us individually. We just pray for your continued presence. We invite your spirit to speak to our hearts and those that are watching. And um, we pray for one another. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we started drawing up this line. I cleaned it up a little bit and I put in a fourth angel arrives because I think we're going to need that for this. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about how this, how lines are constructed. So we know that there's a period of darkness and, and then there's, three messages, and then sometimes a fourth. We draw that out as well, which is just a repeat of the three. Uh, so it's an iteration of, of what has happened before. Um, and we look for historical events to uh, provide us information regarding these waymarks. We're going to have a line that begins, we believe so far, with the fall of Rome in 476 AD, um, and it says 95 years in there. How many years is it uh, between here? That was just left over from before. I just left some of these boxes. Um, so we're going to have, whatever, 32 years in here, and then we're going to have another 30 years here. And... We, we have there 476, 508, and 538. So that's going to be the arrival, the formalization, and the empowerment. And, and we could say that this first message relates to uh, the rise of papal Rome. Now, that's one way of looking at it. It's not necessarily correct, just because we have that there in front of us. Because we don't know what this – well, we know what the line's about. We know it's about papal Rome. Um, but what would be the darkness – that would be addressed by papal Rome coming. So remember, darkness isn't always, you know, evil. It's just something that's not understood that um, unfolds in a series of events. So that means you have information that's being given. So there's information in there. Um and, and usually we have like from the arrival of the first message to the formalization and increase of knowledge. Right. But all, all lines are, have increases of knowledge, but it's just a way mark that we specifically mark. And then we have an empowerment. So there's, there's an arrival of a message. There is a formalization and then there's an empowerment. Now the fall of Rome may not be the start of this line. Um, because we do have other events before the fall of pagan Rome. And one event that we had um, dealing with, with uh, pagan Rome was uh, what happened with the capital moving from Rome to Constantinople. Now, so we could start this line, we could say it has to do with 3.30, so so that's a possibility. I don't know, what, what do we think about 3.30 as the time of the end? Is, would that make sense or not? So are you looking at 3.30 as the conclusion of the time of the end? In other words, the time of the end beginning in 31 BC and concluding in 30 and 3.30 AD? No, we're not gonna have Papal Rome begin in 31. Because this is this is dealing with papal Rome. So the question is, when do we start papal Rome? When is the time of the end that marks the beginning of papal Rome? So here we have 
476, the fall of pagan Rome, as the start of papal Rome. But we could say that the start of papal Rome is when the papacy is given the city of Rome. Now, we know the donation of Constantine is not a real document. It's a forgery. But the idea still is there that when uh, Constantine moved his capital from Rome to Constantinople, to Byzantinium, that um, uh, that that left the papacy to claim the city of Rome as its capital. And, and prior to that, you know, there was, you know, you had the papacy in Alexandria and the papacy in in Rome, or I should say the bishop, right? So the Roman bishop and the Alexandrian bishop. Uh, but eventually, and I would think partly it's because they they were in Rome that they were able to sort of control Roman politics with uh, the vacancy that left there by uh, the emperor once he moved the capital. And so the Western Rome ended up becoming, you know, because it's going to be the one that falls, but it falls progressively, right? So do we mark 330 as the time of the end or 476 or some other date? I mean, is there some some way in which we can decide how this line should be structured? I mean, one of the things that we, we could say is that the cross, which is, is 538, right? We have 538 marked as the cross, and that could be seen as the arrival of the second angel, right? And that would put, you know, 508 over here, the 30 years here, 32 years here, and then you would, um, you know, put 330 over here. So right now we're just kind of, guessing and and we will have evidences that that confirm these structures if they're correct but for now we're just we're just saying here we have some historical events we could put them on a line we could say um so this would then be the fall of rome over here and then you're going to have the capital you know moving here so this would be the time of the end, um, Rome being given uh, to the papacy, right? So obviously the donation of Constantine is not real as a document, but the idea is there. So we could say, well, the papacy receives, um, so here, of course, we're assuming that's going to be 1798. Maybe that's not correct. And then we still have other way marks, you know. So even if we put 538 as the second angel arriving, we still have, you know, a formalization of that message, an empowerment of that message. I mean, is that even correct? So we're just putting some dates. And then what we think about is we say, okay, what is the period of darkness? What is the darkness? And how would these events... Uh, Constantine moving his capital to to Constantinople, the actual fall of Rome, uh, the taking away of the daily. How would those relate to whatever that message would be in response to that darkness? Right? That's how we would formulate this line. Now, when we look at the events themselves uh, in Daniel chapter 11, so we, we have decided we're starting at verse 30, even though we, you know, so we have this uh, verse 30, even though verse 31 is uh, the verse where we see the papacy. That's going to be, um, you know, it, it's the abomination of desolate, desolation is set up. So. But what we have described here is the fall of Rome. So it says, in which the ships of Kittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved, return, have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He, pagan Rome, shall even return, and if intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Now, so that's verse 30. 
Um, so if we go back, um, like verse 29 is going to talk about the time at the end in the future, right? So it's, and then it's going to talk about these events, uh, the fall of Egypt and then the fall of Western Rome. And then we're going to say, well, this is dealing with the dramatic invasions. Now we do have 510 um, as a date that we could, um, or pardon me, 410 AD as a date that we could mark. And, and we don't have here, you know, the donation of Constantine in these verses. And I don't think we had anywhere where it talks about the movement of the capital in Daniel chapter 11. Right. So here we're still dealing with pagan Rome, uh, Octavian. So as far as Daniel 11 itself, it seems like the first thing that it's going to mention is the fall of Rome. That ends up being uh, the first event. And that doesn't mean that that's going to be the time of the end either. I mean, it could be just creating the period of darkness. So we would have to look for symbols that would mark that as the time of the end. Now, normally, what do we have at a time of the end? Why, why is it called the time of the end, generally? Not always in every case, but definitely in, in major lines. The end of darkness. Okay, it's the end of darkness. What else is it at the end of? It isn't necessarily completely the end of darkness. There's a message that comes in response to that darkness, that darkness usually continues, but it's the end of a prophetic period, right? As Arani put there. So, so often we have the end of a prophetic period to mark the time of the end. And, you know, so one way we could look at the time of the end, 538 would be a good date for the time of the end, right? Because we have a prophetic period that ends there. Now, we also do have a prophetic period, sort of, that ends in 508. And that's the 666 years that that Miller recognizes, right? And that's one of the dates that was given to Miller, right? So we got the, the taking away of the daily has a prophetic period attached to it. So... In some ways, putting this as the time of the end might make more sense, which would, if that was the case, we would have to look at this period here as the period of darkness. 538 would then most likely be the formalization of the first angel. But then we'd have to say, well, where is that empowered? Right. So part of it was we have these way marks, but we also have things that are being described, right? So we have events. We have to line these up in some ways that make sense. We don't, we're not sure what this darkness is yet. We haven't decided what darkness we're looking at and how the rise of the papacy addresses that darkness. Now, one of the keys that I would think that we would look at, because we're always looking at scripture, is if we go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and, and we think about, uh, great controversy chapter three as well we know that the man of sin has to be revealed right the son of lawlessness okay man of lawlessness man of sin <clears throat> now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our lord jesus christ here i gotta share this properly okay uh, and by our gathering together unto him that ye be not so soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for except there come a falling away first. So they say, for that day shall not come, but you could just say, for except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that, when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what hindereth, or withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now 
withholds, uh, will continue to do so until he be taken out of the way. So we know that's paganism. That's pagan Rome. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So here, if we're going to look at what is the darkness and what is um, that, that there needs to be this man of sin has to be revealed. Right. That's that's what's being addressed. So Paul is saying you're expecting that Christ is going to come back. But there's going to be this man of sin, which is described in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. And before that man of sin can be revealed, we're going to have to see that that withholds being taken out of the way. So could we say here that the first angel's message has to do in this line? with uh, pagan Rome being taken out of the way. And the second angel's message is the revel- the revealing of the man of sin itself. So this would, this would agree with the idea that the time of the end is not when the man of sin is revealed, but the time of the end is going to be the end of of pagan Rome. Does that make sense? So the first message address addresses the removal of the daily, and the second message addresses the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. Can we agree with that? Or is because because Second Thessalonians is giving us the same message as Daniel chapter eleven, but it's giving us some information. That information is the purpose of pagan Rome being taken out of the way. Any thoughts on that? So if we look at Daniel eleven twenty nine, you know, you can say, well, the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, and it shall be not as the former or as the, as the latter. Now, we know that this time appointed is connected to the time of the end. And, and so that's going to refer to way further down this line, and so when he comes towards the south, it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So the way that we have understood that is that's going to refer to 1989, November 9th, 1989. That's how we understand that time appointed. So it's going to talk about the end here, right, this time appointed. And now it's going to go back to the beginning. So it's saying that, that this history at the end November 9th, 1989, is typified by the beginning. So by, and the beginning is going to be the fall of Rome. Can, can we see that? Now, I want to make sure that people are following what I'm saying, if this, if this is making sense to people. We can see 2 Thessalonians is telling us the same thing as Daniel chapter 11. You know, Christ can't come back yet. There are some things that have to happen first. And that is paganism has to be taken away. The power that that hinders the revealing of the man of sin, because the man of sin has to be revealed. So paganism has to be taken away. Rome has to fall. That's what Paul is saying. And once pagan Rome is taken out of the way, then we have this new power, the abomination of desolation, the man of sin. And then he describes him just as it is in Daniel chapter 11. Right. Once you get to verse 36, he's going to describe him in detail. And so we see the fall of Rome, right? The ships of Kittim. We see arm standing on his part. That's Clovis. The polluting of the sanctuary of strength. Right. So that's that's taking paganism and replacing it with papalism. So taking away the daily. And placing instead the abomination that make it desolate. So we can see in this counterfeit that what we're looking at is we're looking at this sanctuary of strength. This sanctuary of strength is Rome, the pantheon, whatever you want to, want to look at. It's, it's this pagan worship and 
the daily is going to be taken away and in its place something that to the pagans would be an abomination. So their sanctuary is being defiled. And this is all a counterfeit of the earthly and the heavenly sanctuary ministry of Christ. So we have this pagan animal sacrifice system being replaced by the sacrifice of the mass. And then such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flattery. So we we need to understand that a little bit more um, exactly where we would place that. So, I mean, I would think that this has to do with that history once the papacy is set up. And then we know the people that do know their God shall be strong and do. And they're going to uh, teach the gospel message. They're going to instruct many, they that understand. Yet they're going to be persecuted and fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil. And then it's going to say many days. But many is just an added word there. So in verse 33... So we just, I need to do that in my, so it's, it's, it says days and, and we take those days to be the 1260 years because it's 1260 days. It doesn't give us a number there. Right? It doesn't say, does nothing really to qualify the days. It's just days, but we understand that those days are the 1260. And, and we know that there's also going to be in verse 34, it says, when they shall fall, that during this persecution, they're going to be helped with a little help. But some shall cleave to them with flatteries. Right? So we know that there are, is because of these flatteries that and we have to look at that a little bit more, I think, to try to figure out if we can place this in some specific time. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge them and to make them white, even to the time of the end. And we know we connected that with um, <clears throat> Daniel 12, verse, uh, verse 10, was it? Yeah. And then it's going to give us the time that the daily is taken away and the abomination maketh set up. So there shall be 1,290 days. So it's really from when the daily is taken away. And then it says, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. So in Daniel chapter 12. So we can attach what we see in Daniel chapter 11 there. Uh, verse 33, we can attach that to Daniel chapter 12 to 1260. Or, or verse 35, pardon me. Um, and then it says, you know, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So we said that that's the period of the three angels' messages. So we, we need to put that in there. And then it's going to des- describe the papacy. The king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself, magnify himself before every god. So this is obviously during the 1260, not at the end. So it's going to describe his character. So this is Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So then when we get to verse 40, we can see that that time at the end, 1798, is going to be talked about. And then we're going to move to our time. So so we have to decide, you know, in this line, I would say that we would take Daniel 11, verse 40b, and we would attach that to the fourth angel arriving, and that history would be the history of the Sunday law. So, so when we go to this line... We, the time in the end, I don't think we can put, uh, I don't know if we'd put it in 508. I don't think we would do 330. But could we do it as uh, 410? That the first thing that we're going to deal with is the removal of of them that hinders, hinders the, and then would we put the event with the Bible marks, which is, the ships of Kitten. Any thoughts on that? Any any discussion? Because we, we would say the ships of Kitten are 410 AD. I guess they have here 410 AD, the Visigoths, the Vandals here. I'm just going to look at one of my papers. So are we applying this with the ships of Kitten as a 
an economic power as has been presented in the past? Okay. Um, uh, I don't remember ever applying it to an economic power in the past. So I can't answer that question. I always just applied it to the Germanic tribes coming in and, you know, waging war against the Roman Empire, Western Rome. So you're saying that we did apply it to economic? As we had been looking at this as a a present truth application in the past. Okay. But we're not looking at the present truth application right now. Okay. We're just looking at, we're just looking at the historical application. We're going to put that on a line first. Okay. And so, because, I mean, I can keep thinking about the, you know, the present truth applications, but in order to get this done correctly, we, we got to use the scriptures. We have to understand what the historic application is before we can understand the repeat of history. Now, um, So what we have here, this is just a diagram from one of my papers, uh, the progressive destruction of Western Rome. So it's going to use these these four trumpets. Um, They're going to have Alaric and the Goths. They're going to have 395 to 410. And then the second trumpet, uh, 428 to 468, that's Genseric with the Vandals. And then the third trumpet, is going to be 451 to 453. That's the Huns. And then the fourth trumpet, 476 to 490, right? So 476 marked as the fall of Rome. And that's going to be uh, the Heruli under Odiacer. Oda Oda Acer. I don't know how you pronounce his name. Right. And these are going to be in uh, Revelation chapter Eight as uh, these symbols, the one fa- the 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 trumpets that address the earth, the sea, the rivers, and the heavens. Right, That's, those are going to be the symbols: hail, fire, and blood on the earth, the burning mountain into the sea, the great star into the rivers, and the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens. Um, having these um, events. Connected with them. The dark day, the falling of the stars, that kind of stuff. Okay, so those types of symbols. So we've got the progressive destruction of Western Rome. Uh, I got some maps here, the three parts of Rome. So there's the Gothic invasion, uh, Vandals, the Heruli, and I don't really have the three maps. Yeah, anyway. These I didn't make. I just borrowed them from a uh, guy's website. Okay, so we might have to learn more about that history to understand this better. But as, as far as this, uh, this chart, I, I don't think we would put, um, you know, each of the, you know, the Germanic tribes and list them. We would just say, Basically, from 410 to 476, you have this period of time. Um, and this period of time here, I'm just going to move this over here. This is going to be 66 years. Okay. Now, we know that, that 508, it has a you know, a time prophecy attached to it. And that's why we'd say, well, that that looks like the time of the end. We don't have a time prophecy that I know of uh, for 410. What about 476? Is there anything we can do with 476? Still considering it. <clears throat> don't know. Okay. So I'm going to put 32 years back here. Okay. So the 66 years is interesting because we know that there is – a 666 year period that is, uh, I don't know how to do this. They'll do it this way. So we got 666 years here. I'm just going to use a dotted line. Okay. So we got 666 years ending there in 508. 
And then we have the 66 years over here. Anything else? We have 98 years from 410 to 508. I mean, which is 2 times 49. I don't know if that means anything. So Clovis's baptism, December 25th, 508. We get the fall of Rome. So we can we can say that there is this time of the end in 508, but we're not putting 508 as the time of the end. So the question is, can we put, see, and, and, and my preference, so I'm just going to, see, I mean, I would like this to be the empowerment of the first angel's message, this to be the formalization. And I would actually prefer this to be the time of the end. Because to me, the fall of Rome marks the time of the end of Rome, pagan Rome, but we know that there's this progression from when pagan Rome falls to when papal Rome begins. But I still like this 600, this 666 years here, that that is, is connected to the 666 years here. And so this all would be part of this darkness. And we could say that this darkness is what? What is the darkness from 410 to 476? You are quiet class this morning. What are we equating this time of darkness to? Well, that's why I'm asking. What is it that we're equating it to? If I say that this is the time of darkness, and it begins in 410, and it's going to last for 66 years, and it's going to end with the fall of Rome, and we think about Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 11. What is it talking about? Uh, because we know that, that, that paganism has to be taken out of the way. The daily has to be removed because it's a power that hinders the rise of the papacy. So we would have to describe this darkness. If you're going to have the first angel arrive with the fall of Rome, and it's formalized with the baptism of Clovis, and it's empowered with uh, the papacy being set up in 538, then what is the darkness? What are those three messages addressing? And then we would have the problem of trying to figure out when the second angel arrives, what that is. So we'd have that date to figure out that event. We would have, um, you know, formalization. I don't know. I'm just going to, I don't know. Here, get rid of this for now. And we get a third angel arriving. I don't know. Maybe I'll copy this, put it over here. So we have some other event. So we have events that we have to mark. And we have to mark, like, the third angel arriving somewhere. And whether we have the fourth angel arriving. In this line, I mean, I, I'm just taking the fourth angel as being our history. So I still like the third, the third angel arriving as being 1798. I know we're working through this rather slowly, but you know, we want to, we want to understand what it is we're doing. Also going to have a 1260. And I, I think that we need to put in, uh, a 1335 as well. We still have a lot of way marks that we have to place here. And, and people always ask me about the 1335, when does it end? And, and we know that it ends um, in 1844, but it's on April 18th, you know, at sunset, technically, because it's, it's 1335 years. And it's going to end at the Ju end of the Jewish year, 1843. It's five plus eight is three. So, but we're going to put that there. And that's just going to then mark, you know, the start of uh, the second angel arriving, right? So fourth angel arrives. That's the second angel. So there we could mark that as the fourth angel arriving. That might be one way to do it. But then we have all of this second angel that we don't have anything for, right? If we're going to do the line this way. So 
we may we may change that. I don't know. But but that's one way we could look at it. We could look at it as uh, the time appointed here is going to be that history dealing with 1844, the time of the end, 1798. But now we have the man of sin uh, is revealed in 538. But then we have to have a second angel, the second angel's message. Now, one way we could do this is we could say, well, the second angel arriving is in 1798. Its formalization is, you know, at the arrival when when um, the first disappointment happens. Its empowerment is um, you know, October 22, 1844. We could do that. We could just say that that's the second angel of this line. But then we have to we have to have a reason for that. Like we have, I, I think we can see here that the first angel. Its arrival, formalization, and empowerment makes sense. And that the darkness then that it's addressing has to do with what happens when Rome falls. The daily is being taken out of the way. Because it's the power that's hindering. So, so this period of darkness has to do, Rome is now falling. We have these Germanic tribes coming in. We have a period of 66 years. And then Rome falls. We have the fall of Rome, Western Rome. You know, so maybe I should put fall of Western Rome. You know, there's still Eastern Rome. Now, what if we put, now we know that the papacy arrives, right? But what about Eastern Rome? Does it have any part here in this line? that we could say that Eastern Rome falling is has to do with the second angel. Would that make any sense at all? That, so we have, because if we're looking at this, Daniel chapter 11, and, and we're getting this information about the ships of Kittim, what prophecy are we looking at in, in the Bible? It's not in Daniel chapter 11. We're looking at, we're understanding Daniel 11. We're using what prophecy? We're using the, the first four trumpets dealing with the fall of Rome, right? All right. Okay. So Revelation 8. Now the fall of Eastern Rome is Revelation 9. Would we agree with that? So could we say that the second angel's message addresses Revelation 9 and Islam? Because here we have the Germanic tribes conquering Western Rome. But what part would, you know, Islam conquering Eastern Rome, what would that have to do with this history? Because we always just think of papal Rome, it's about the Pope. But is there any part of the fall of Eastern Rome that's connected with understanding this history? Does the fall of Eastern Rome concentrate the power in in Western Rome? Yeah, that's the question. I mean, I would say it does. Now, there's a lot of things that happens in this history. So, because I was thinking about, okay, you know, we got the papacy arising. You know, what's really happening in that history? Because, you know, the papacy is there in Western Rome. But the papacy's powers is does increase in some ways, uh, you know, from that time that it's, it's set up in 538, it obviously increases. And, and it's going to talk about what the papacy does in Daniel chapter 11. Okay. So, so when we look at, at these verses that we're studying, so we're going to have the baptism of Clovis, right? Um, that's the arm standing on his part polluting the sanctuary of strength, taking away the daily, and placing the abomination that make it desolate, right? 538. And then such as do wickedly against the covenant, okay, shall he, the papacy, the spiritual king of the north, we have here, corrupt by flatteries, flatter with prospects of position, material gain, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do, do exploits, right? And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Now, let me see. 
gosh, I just exploits is such a weird word. Um, not sure what it means as far as why they put it in there. So they're going to do, right? Exploits is an added word. So I, I just crossed it out. I could have put it in italics. Maybe I'll put it in italics as well. Right. So I just, I never think it, it, it really, it's not the right word for me. It's, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a good word in old English, but it just, what's an exploit? You know, that, that they shall do something, right? They're doing something. Okay, so um, so we know there's going to be the persecution. That's going to be verse 33. And then there's some stuff in verse 34 and 35 that's going to address, uh, um, you know, the end from 1798 uh, to the time appointed. And, and then it's going to describe the papacy again. So So in these verses here, I think that we have to, to figure out what's happening from 508 to this persecution. Now, there's there's lots of things that happen. So when I was um, studying this history, uh, we're going to have um, uh, the Crusades. We're going to have the Inquisition. I mean, there's a lot of history in there. Um we're going to have the Protestant Reformation in in the 1260, right? So, so we had have to figure out what what specifically that we that this is describing that we need to to mark. And and so when I look at um, verse 32, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, so um, so we're taking the covenant here as being. Uh, the Holy Covenant, right? That's talked about in at the end of verse 30. They that forsake the Holy Covenant. And then it says, such as do wickedly against the covenant. Now, part of what I looked at there is I saw this 7561. I said, that's a lot like 7651, uh, Shiva, right? Seven times. And then, of course, we have the covenant, Berit. And then... Um, is corrupting by flatteries. Now we just have this sort of general idea, this flatter with prospects of position and material gain. But is there some historical event that we could could mark with this flatteries, this corruption? Right? That's that's so such as do wickedly against the covenant. Shall he corrupt by flattery? So, you know, the question I always ask is, who is the he? Right? We're just saying it's the papacy. But maybe, maybe it's, it's someone else. And, and who specifically is being corrupt? Well, we're saying, well, it's those that do wickedly against the covenant. So if we look at this language, so verse 32, I'm going to look at this a little bit more. So we have this word, um, Corrupt. So that's be profane, be defiled, be polluted, be corrupt. So this is a type of pollution, right? So it's not talking about specific sins or anything like in corruption that way. And then we have this word uh, flattery. So from 2505, it's 2514. And against Rasha. To condemn, to vex, to trouble. They that trouble the covenant, he shall corrupt by flatteries. Uh, but the people, and you can see people here is am, right? So sometimes you see the word people, and it's, it's the word nations. That's goy or goyim, right? If it's in the plural, it's goyim. Um, but here this is the word Specifically, it's a tribe often referred to God's people, right? They can be, you know, they're going to use this word, right? Um, like Ami means my people that do know their God. So this idea of no, uh, it has way a lot of variety of meaning here. 
So it's it's pretty deep type of knowing. Yada. And of course, God is Elohim. They shall be strong. Uh, it is to fasten upon, hence to seize, be strong. They'll be obstinate to bind, restrain, conquer. So lots of different meanings of this word. Seize, be stout, okay, withstand. Uh, they shall be strong and do, right? So the idea of do, like put exploits there, but just means to do or make in the broadest sense and widest application. Accomplish, advance, appoint, come, bear, bestow, bring forth. Right? So there's lots of different things that could be connected to this idea of doing but it's you know it's 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 action there's things that are happening right so that's why they put exploits i guess there so they're accomplishing something what it is they're accomplishing is not defined here right because it could be you know journey labor um exercise Right. So there's just so many things it can be. It's just a very broad word. But they're going to be strong and do. And these are the people that know their God. So this is God's people, right? They shall be strong and do, right? So the idea that we had here is, um, <clears throat> you know, they're going to be faithful to God. And they're going to preach the truth and win many true converts. That to me makes sense. So we're saying those that do wickedly against the covenant, we're saying that those that turn against the gospel through recantation, that's, that's what we have. What if it's, it's, um, referring to something else? Like if we, could we connect this to Revelation chapter nine? Could we connect this to Islam as the one that does wickedly against the covenant? Would that make sense? <clears throat> Any thoughts? I mean, it's a new thought. Just, we looked at Revelation 9 there. Could this, could this address that, that that's what's going to happen there in that history? And if, and if those that are do wickedly are Islam, that's is, is Islam during that period of time. There's lots of things they do. So if they do wickedly against uh, the covenant, or to the covenant, um, do we have anywhere that if the he is the papacy, does the papacy corrupt uh, by flatteries, you know, those that do wickedly against the covenant, if that's Islam? Do we have any, I mean, they're going to be at war with each other for a long time, right, because we have the Crusades. Any thoughts on on putting Islam in here? I'm considering. I mean, this is this is indeed a different kind of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just just considering it. Whether it's just because we looked at Daniel chapter eight and that was dealing with the fall of Western Rome, could we put the fall of Eastern Rome in here? Is this being described in any way? I mean, I don't know if I understand this history all that much. I mean, I. You know, obviously understand these main events. And I've looked quite a bit as at Islamic history and I've studied into the Crusades. But I'm, you know, there's way more there than I've ever understood. But we, we know persecution is going to be described in verse 33. And, you know, and where could we mark this specifically? I mean, we just talked about the 1260s being a period of persecution, but persecution is not happening the whole time. Um, you know, could this be referring to uh, the Inquisition? So we know verse 34 is going to be addressing um, the United States, the new world. Verse 35 is going to be addressing from the time of the end to it's the proclamation of the everlasting gospel in Millerite history. Right. And then when we get to verse 36, where it's going to talk about 
the man of sin himself, the Pope. Right? It, it's, it's basically going back and talking about the character of this power that his, has going to begun, you know, in 538, the abomination of desolation. It's going to describe it. So these other things are describing, you know, so we, first we get the fall of, of Western Rome, right? Arm standing on his part, 508. And then the question is, do 32, 33, 34, and 35 address um, first the fall of Eastern Rome and then the persecution of the Dark Ages with verse 36 um, to 39, talking about the papal power itself and then its fall. Right? So its characteristics that it that it has. And then we get to verse 40, the time of the end, right? So, so it's just going to give us this characteristic of this power that's going to end. I mean, I, I can sort of see it in my mind, but I need, you know, the details are not refined. Now, if Islam does wickedly against the covenant, I mean, we know um, Abu Bakr's command, right? He, he's going to say, well, basically, Leave the Sabbath keepers alone. Just attack uh, those that don't have the mark or the seal or whatever, right? The seal of God. So there's some that have the seal of God. Those ones you're not going to kill. You're going to kill the Catholics. But can we say that, that Islam does wickedly against the covenant and are they corrupted by flatteries from the papacy? So I think we would need to understand that history of the interactions between Islam and the papacy in that period. Okay, I'm going to read this here. So I just typed in some stuff and got this web page. So let's look at this. So it says the development of papal supremacy. So it's some kind of course, Lumen, Western Civilization, the Middle Ages in Europe, learning objective, explain the development of papal supremacy. So, I, so it's just going to give us some really sketchy things here, but maybe there's some ideas. So during the history of Christianity, Rome became an increasingly important center of the faith, which gave the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, more power over the entire church, thereby ushering in the era of papal supremacy. When Catholicism became the official religion of the Roman Empire in 380, the power of the Pope increased, although he was still subordinate to the emperor. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the Pope served as a source of authority and continuity. However, for several centuries afterward, the Eastern Roman Empire still maintained authority over the church. From the late 6th to the late 8th century, there was a turning of the papacy to the West, and an escape from subordination to the authority of the Byzantine emperors of Constantinople. When Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne as Roman emperor in 800, he established the precedent that in Western Europe, no man would be emperor without being crowned by a pope. After a conflict known as the investiture controversy, as well as from the launching of the Crusades, the papacy increased its power in relation to the secular rulers of Europe. Throughout the Middle Ages, Pope struggled with monarchs over power. So there are some things here that are interesting. So one is we have Charlemagne, and, and he's going to be crowned emperor in 800. Um, so we got here, I'm just typing in. So it's going to be in 800, December 25th, right? Just checking. So it says the dramatic zenith of his partnership with the church occurred on December 25th, 800, in the old Basilica of St. Peter in Rome when Pope Leo III interrupted Christmas Mass to place a crown on Charles, Charles's head and anointed him emperor. Okay. So can we, can we mark that anywhere? Should that be significant in our lines, in this line? As, as connected to the papal power. So I'm, I'm just putting this here. So a lot of this stuff we might end up reworking quite a bit. But if we put 800 in here, 
I mean, I'm not sure if that's the second angel arriving or, you know, maybe this line changes in some ways. But we have a way mark um, that we have 1225. So we know that that's significant, 1225. And, and the point here is that we're addressing now the fact that in order for anybody to be crowned emperor, he needs to be crowned emperor by the Pope. Okay, that's not true in the past that it has to happen, but with Charlemagne that does happen. You know, at the December twenty fifth date, so maybe this, you know, this has to do with his increased power in some way. Any thoughts on that? Now, Charlemagne is, of course, uh, the emperor of the Western Roman Empire, right? Not the Eastern Roman Empire. So that's one one more date that we could put in there. Um, now, what about what about Constantine the Eleventh? So he's the one that's going to be, um, well, he's the last emperor of Rome, and he's going to be um, made emperor from 1449, uh, four years before the fall of Constantinople, and 1449 is the end of the hundred and. 50 years or five months. So anything we can think of there. And, and the reason why I'm thinking about him is the fact that um, he's going to be the last person crowned emperor. And it's going to be, um, let me see here. So Constantine's going to be proclaimed emperor on January 6th, 1449. Now it's going to be the Eastern Catholic Church that's going to, of course, be involved in his being made or coronation, his crowning. So it's something to consider. So we're going to have to consider this a little bit more before we come to the study next time. I'll, I'll read a bit more up on it. Uh, I mean, the January 6th date is interesting. Though there's lots of interesting dates. But now, because re- remember when we have the, the first woe, it's, uh, it's five months, 150 years from, uh, July 27th, Julian, in 1299. And and we just go to July 27th in 1449. Now, nothing happens on July 27th in 1449. Um, We know it's also July 18th. Uh, You know, depends how we count it, uh, the 150 years. But if we take the 26th day of the fourth month, on the biblical calendar, you know, we know that it, it gives us this July 18 date on the Julian calendar and July 27th on the Gregorian calendar in 1449. But we also have now this other date in 1449 when Constantine is proclaimed emperor. Now, it's... um Trying to remember exactly how this worked. Let's see it here. This doesn't seem to have all the information. Because I know he's going to um like to just to become emperor, he's going to yield to the Turkish sultans, but I don't see that here. I'm gonna have to look up that history a little bit more. Right. And and he's the guy that's uh misnamed uh uh, Dracoses, right, by um, Josiah Lich. It's a typo that, that obviously the book that he had had a typo in it because it's Dragoses, not Dracoses, Constantine Dracoses. Paleologos is his name. Constantine the 11th Dragoses, which means... Uh, can't remember now. I'm gonna have to look that up. A- any, any thoughts on what we're looking at here? Cause if we're gonna put Charlemagne in there, can we put 1449 in there? Can we put, um, you know, how is this, you know, are we gonna put, you know, 1299, 1449, 1798? Uh, obviously we don't have 1840 in here. Maybe there's just some way to mark that history with one date. And that's a lot of things to think about. 
it's a very slow study, but you know, I, I think we're getting somewhere. Okay. No more thoughts. Nobody has any thoughts. I'm out of thoughts. So if nobody has any anything to contribute here, we can just close with prayer just a little bit early. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study. And we just ask for your continued help as we study this on our own. We know that there's much that we don't understand. And we ask for your spirit to teach us. Be with us throughout this day. We ask for your angels care and protection for one another, for our families, and for the ministry we have to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.